elevate your voice. Fight for your rights. Speak up. Speak out. We're union and we're proud. Go union. Live from Maryland, this is Activate Live. Welcome to Activate Live, our weekly show about the machinist union, organized labor, and working people in general. I'm Tanya Hutchins, coming to you live from our headquarters in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Thank you for joining us one day before Thanksgiving. We hope you have tomorrow off, but if you don't, we have been there. I've been there personally in jobs where I had to work Thanksgiving and Christmas. So I'm going to actually read from my script now because I had a script malfunction. Um, today we're going to introduce you to some of the workers who are fighting the California wildfires and we'll celebrate Native American Heritage Month uh, with an update from Council Fire and that stands for the Council for First Inhabitants Rights and Equality. But first, here is what's going on around the labor movement and also around the machinist union. So Guide Dogs of America presented its highest honor this past weekend in Las Vegas. It was the Gift of Sight Award. It went to three recipients this past weekend at the annual charity banquet. I am General Secretary Dora Cervantes, Tony and Teresa Blevins, who you see here. Um, Teresa is a graduate of Guide Dogs of America. And then also, there you see Dora Cervantes in the center there uh, with our international president, Bob Martinez and Russ Gitlin. And also, National Group Protection Incorporated received the Gift of Sight Award as well. That group has done so much for Guide Dogs of America as well. So we are just so thankful for everybody who has fundraised at all of these events. The Hogs for Dogs motorcycle ride drew a large group of participants to raise funds for the nonprofit, along with a sporting clay event as well. Look at that, riding the bike there. They have so much fun out there. There is Andy Hounshall at the sporting clay event. Um, there's also a golf tournament where guide dogs are always allowed on the course. Who can resist those faces? I'm talking about the dogs. Their presence is a constant reminder of the good work that GDA does to train blind and visually impaired adults and their service dog partners, all at no cost whatsoever. That's for the life of, of the team. I am International President Bob Martinez addressed a retirement security and other topics about retirement at the Alliance for Retired Americans membership meeting in Las Vegas. Martinez sits on the Alliance's executive board and highlighted the IAM's work to find solutions to fund insolvent multi-employer pension plans. Well, yesterday marked the 16th birthday of the United Launch Alliance's Delta IV heavy rocket made by IAM Local 44 members Indicator, Alabama. ULA says Delta IV has launched 37 times, including the nation's most critical heavy payloads. So keep up the good work, Local 44. A big shout out to everyone celebrating a union made Thanksgiving with Butterball and Boar's Head, just to name a few. Big thanks to our IAM members who work at Ocean Spray and Reynolds Wrap, just to name a couple companies. I use both of those products quite a bit, and I'm sure you do too. And if you show up to your Thanksgiving dinner with flowers in hand, you can support union members with Teleflora. Union members get a 25% discount through Union Plus. UnionPlus.org is always a good site to check for union members' consumer benefits. Well, California wildfires often make national news, even international news, because of the danger, damage, and potential loss of life. The workers on the front lines fighting those fires put their own lives at risk to save others. The National Federation of Federal Employees Forest Service Council represents more than 20 thousand Forest Service workers, and that's across the United States in 133 different organizational units. Now, there are 45 NEFI IAM local lodges in the Forest Service alone. And joining us now to tell us a little bit about what the firefighters are going through in all those locals um, and with all those workers who are battling these wildfires is local 1995 president Eric Apland. Eric, thank you for joining us. 
We appreciate yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now, where do most of the members in your local work? Um, so our local is, is quite big. It spans a large geographic area. So we have people that live in Reno on, on the east side and then all the way over to Chico um, on the west side. So it's, it's quite big. Um, but the majority of the members are in the Sierra Nevada mountains around Quincy um, and then also uh, down in the foothills, Chico and Oroville, California. Now, we've seen the fires on the news. A lot of people just have so much sympathy because this is such a difficult and dangerous job. Can you tell us a little bit about what these working conditions have been like? Yeah, it, this, was, uh, this was a pretty extreme fire, um, even by the standards of, of these large uh, brush fires. Um, it went from a small start, a small 10-acre fire, Town um, in about an hour and a half. So the conditions were extreme wind, um, uh, long flame lengths, like you see in that in that photo there with the dozer. Um, just chaos of trying to get evacuees out, uh, homes burning. Uh, you had propane tanks exploding in town. It was uh, apocalyptic. Um, it sounds like. Uh, from, from the folks that I've talked to who were on the ground um, in the initial stage of the, the firefight there. Now you just mentioned that dozer that we just saw there. What are some of the other tools that you use to fight these fires? So we typically, uh, and this is across all agencies, across all uh, uh, wildland fire responders, we have heavy equipment, so we, we have bulldozers. Um, we have, and those cut a, a pretty wide fire line. Uh, and then we have fire engines that deliver water uh, to the to put out the fire. And then hand crews are kind of the, the backbone of the of the force. And they're twenty person crews that use chainsaws and tools like axes and shovels um, to clear away a, a a line about the size of a, a trail. Uh, and that just removes enough uh, vegetation for the fire to burn up to that line and then stop. Now, is this a hand crew um, here? Photo, no, so in that photo you see an engine and you've got um, some of the engine crew members uh, deploying hose off the front of the engine and they can just, uh, as the engine rolls along, they just stay ahead of it and, and spray out the fire as they go through, uh, through the grass, very effective in, in grass and light fuel like that. We often hear the term, and I don't know if it's an older term or not, but the hot shot um, squads. What are those? So hotshot, hotshot crews. It is a yeah. It's an old term that has stuck around since uh, the very beginning. They were the first organized fire crews um, in the United States for wildland fires. Uh, they started in the, the late 1940s down in Southern California, and they're groups of 20 people that bring chainsaws and hand tools um, to to the fire line, they hike into the fire typically. Sometimes they'll get delivered by helicopter. Um, and they, they just, they do an immense amount of work of, of clearing, uh, clearing the vegetation, of preparing areas for uh, back burns so they rob that fire of the, of the fuel that it needs. They just burn it out under, under their conditions. Um, we have around 60 hotshot crews in the state of California. And they, they really are, they do an immense amount of work. Um, they're gone all summer long going from fire to fire. Yeah, they're, they're some of the most highly trained, um, hardest working firefighters uh, in the, on the wildland side. When it comes to the union, how many of these national forests in California are organized? Yeah, so we have uh, 17 national forests in the state of California, and we have 15 that are organized um, all through NEFI. Um, there are two forests that aren't organized, one in uh, Northern California and one in Southern California. Um, what are the challenges? 
you know, what are the challenges oh. of representing workers who are non-members when there are limited resources? Because I guess if everybody joins and becomes, you know, dues-paying members, um, then you have more of an ability to represent them. What are the challenges when you run into that? Yeah, you know, we have an interesting contract. Um, we are allowed to use government time and government facilities to carry out union business. Um, and our contract is pretty wide open as to the amount of time that we can use for representation. So it, it's kind of an interesting thing. But so what we really run into is simply the number of people that we have who we are obligated by law to represent and then the very few members that we have and then consequently the very few officers and stewards that we have to really do that representational work. Um, so we really are pushing uh, recruitment and uh, we have had actually had some success in the last six months in, in bringing up our numbers a little bit. but. There's just a, a huge need, you know, there's always something going on with hiring, with discipline, uh, all kinds of things that happen at, at every workplace. But we have, we have very few, very committed, but very few stewards to, to take on a pretty huge load. So I guess the more people that join, after they do join, they, they realize the benefits of being a dues paying member. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes, you know, it takes talking to a steward and seeing how committed the stewards are to help them, how much time they'll spend, you know, at work, um, on the union time at work, or after hours on their own time, you know, they see how committed the stewards are and realize that the union isn't just there to collect dues, um, that they actually are there working to, you know, represent the employees and protect the contract. Um, and I actually have talked to some people who are, um, who, are, who have come from non-union forests and they say that the, the difference is really striking. Just having the union there makes a huge difference in what management uh, can do, you know, and, and, and non-union forest management um, tends to just kind of make decisions and the, the workers don't really have much of a redress to it. Eric, we have a comment here from James Price, who is our Director of Government and um, employees and he says these members are real heroes putting their lives on the line every fire season some of our members lost their homes while saving others jim has esp because i was just going to ask you about this about the sacrifices that a lot of these members are making um, and we're going to try to talk to another firefighter right after your interview but can you just tell us about some of these sacrifices when you're leaving to go to work and you're worried about your own home because I heard you have some personal stories. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible what, what happened, especially in this fire. Because um, every day that you go to work, uh, no matter what kind of firefighter you are, every day that you go to work, you, you have no clue where the day is going to bring you. Um, this, you know, on last uh, two Thursdays ago now, on the 8th, um, it, was pretty, uh, it, was, it was a pretty wild day. We had people showing up to work. They already saw a huge column of smoke threatening a town that many people at our workplace live in. Um, and I saw uh, our two our two members who operate our bulldozer were transporting the dozer um, on their semi. And uh, I talk, I called them on the radio and I said, you know, well, uh, you, you know, do good work up there, be safe, and. Uh, you know, I didn't realize at that time, but uh, one of the dozer operators, uh, his his wife uh, and and uh, son had evacuated from their home, and uh, while he was out there um, cutting line with the dozer, his home burned to the ground. Um, we had all told between members and uh, bargaining unit employees, non-members, about 20, 20 folks on our forest uh, in our bargaining unit that lost their home in this fire. It was. Uh, basically wiped out the whole town, which is pretty unheard of. That is just unbelievable. Um, we have a comment from Dave Lehive who's saying thank you and all of the brothers and sisters for the work you do fighting these fires. So, I mean, we just can't believe some of the working conditions that you have to deal with, the danger, 
Um, but it is just, you know, so representative of these, you know, first responders who are out there. So we are so thankful, um, especially at this Thanksgiving of all the work that you do. Um, Eric, before you leave, um, you know, you mentioned some of the members that had lost their homes and were evacuating. I understand that there's a fund that has been set up um, for the Plumas National Forest Fire victims. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, so uh, between the union and management, we uh, worked together to try to do everything we could to all, for all of our employees who were directly affected by the fire. And so we have this fund uh, for uh, uh, victim relief for folks that lost their homes in the campfire. Um, and this fund will, unlike a GoFundMe that's for a specific family, you know, a specific person, um, this is just a, a collective fund for for everyone that, that lost property in this fire, um, to my knowledge, all of those people are bargaining unit employees represented by FBI AM uh, 1995. Um, so, if, yeah, if folks could give for that, that would be hugely appreciated. Okay, and understand it's pronounced Robo Bank, and checks can be made payable to the PNF Fire Victim Relief Fund. Eric, is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, I just want, yeah, I did want to say that uh, one of the uh, dozer operators and I went to uh, the IAM uh, uh, training center there in Placid Harbor uh, just about a month ago, and the solidarity and brotherhood that we, we saw there, that we experienced there among machinists from all over the country and Canada was really something that I've never experienced before. Um, and, and then adding on top of it, this the, the how proactive you all have been with with telling our story and and getting like that relief fund out there is just uh, it it means a lot to us uh, more than you know. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Eric Appland, president of Nephi Local. 1995. Thanks you so much. And again, if you would like to donate to the fund because some of those firefighters had to evacuate and lost their homes while they were fighting that fire, um, you can make a check out to PNF Fire Victim Relief Fund. And you can see there it's addressed to Rabobank, um, 2227 Meyer Street in Oroville, California. 95966 and we will try to post this in comments later on in case you're watching the replay spread the word because we really need to help these members out there who are risking their lives every day to save others and we understand there may be rain in the forecast um, I forgot to ask Eric about that we're hoping that it will rain um, but let's see if we have another firefighter on the line I'm gonna yell out to Joe Joe who do we have Carl Zinn Let's see if Carl's there and he can hear us. Carl, can you hear us? I hear you. I don't know if you can hear me, though. Can you hear? I can hear you. Great. Thank you so much for taking time out, Carl. Not a problem. Okay, so Carl, t Carl tell us a little bit about your job. What do you do? Uh, so I'm a heavy equipment operator uh, for the Forest Service, and uh, that, that uh, uh, fire dozer picture was actually uh, the dozer I work on. That was my partner. Uh, who lost it? I actually grabbed that picture. I was running around on a quad, and and uh, and uh, yeah, just working. And you work with AJ as well. Yeah, a that's right. AJ Shepard. Yep. That's AJ right there. Yeah. Yeah. That is a massive dozer. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's big enough to get the job done, and small enough to sneak through the timber here on the Plumas. Now, Carl, what is it like when you're actually out there and the fire is right in front of you? Um, I can't imagine what's that like trying to fight it and save yourself at the same time. Well, uh, I mean, we spend thousands of hours training and uh, and becoming proficient at our job and recognizing weather and uh, fire patterns and fire behavior and reading the train and everything. So. So generally, it's uh, it's pretty easy to stay uh, stay focused on the job and stay safe uh, while while um, meeting mission elements, you know. And uh, uh, but it's humbling and it, it's nerve rattling, especially when uh, like this fire, for instance, you know, trying to clear safety zones for people and uh, trying to get traffic out safely and 
and, and still um, and still operate uh, around a high level of uh, of people in the area uh, trying to evacuate. And, and you know they're not trained like we are, so sometimes it gets a little messy. But you know we just uh, stay focused on on what we know and uh, and keep everyone safe. How does this fire and the work that you were doing compare to previous fires? Because I know this one was deadly. Um, I'm not sure, is this the deadliest one in recent history? Oh, you know, I, I, I can't speak to that. I know it's an it's a extreme tragedy. Uh, you know, um, uh, it, it was hard to take, I know that. Um, as far as uh, the worst fire, is the worst fire I've ever been a part of. Uh, I've been on some pretty bad ones. Um, and I think the fire just ran so fast. And uh, it just, uh, yeah, it was just catastrophic. Is there rain in the forecast? Was I correct in hearing that? You were. It's actually uh, looking out the window. It's raining right now. It's, uh, it, it, started, it started raining pretty good for the past couple hours. Uh, hopefully it'll keep coming for the next two or three days. Um, it let the fire crews really get a handle on this. I, I, I think they got it pretty much, uh, pretty much contained, but, uh, or controlled, excuse me. But, uh, yeah, this rain will really help them. That's what I was going to ask you. How much does that help when it rains for days and not just a couple hours? Oh, it's huge. Uh, you know, water, uh, you know, fires really don't go out without water. You know, you can put all the lines you want, uh, but they, it really starts testing your lines when you don't have uh, any water delivery. Um, you know, and sometimes we work in such remote places that rain's the only way to put out some of these fires. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, is there anything you'd like to mention that we didn't discuss? Uh, no, I, I, I think that covered it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Carl Zinn, another dozer operator working hard out there in our Western Territory. Actually, it's Nephi, IAM, so, but it's still in the West. Um, and a lot of our Western Territory union members are so thankful for all of the work that you do. Um, so thank you so much to Eric Applin, the president of Nephi Local 1995. And also thank you so much um, to Carl Zinn, who just joined us to talk about his job as well. Um, we are very thankful on this Thanksgiving um, for all that they have sacrificed with their time and their job and, and going out there with this dangerous job uh, to try to save homes and lives in our forest. Um, so we can't be more thankful than we are now. And thank you for your time. So it's fitting today that we are putting these faces to the wildfires. If you would like to comment, um, you can do that on Facebook and Twitter. You can even do it on YouTube. Um, let's give some support to all of our firefighters out there. We have a comment from Adam Beasley saying, gotta go, gotta go work time, but he's saying having a great day and Thanksgiving, everyone. Adam, we're so thankful that you were able to listen to those last couple interviews. Hunter Scott is saying happy Thanksgiving from Local Lodge 66. Same to you, Hunter. We appreciate you taking the time. Um, Adriana Picasso is saying we got a butterball turkey. So Adriana is keeping it a union Thanksgiving. Uh, we had a, a, a graphic up earlier, so Adriana is telling us uh, that she's taking part in that union made Thanksgiving. So what do you think about our IAM heroes? So comment to activate your voice. Give all of our firefighters a shout out out in California. Give a shout out to Nephi IAM, uh, all the then the Forest Service Council out there um, for all of the work that they do every day. So this is our time to thank all of the union members in Nephi IAM. Well, it's National Native American Heritage Month, and we thought it would be good to highlight something that we're very proud of. The IAM is so proud that one of our Grand Lodge representatives founded the Council for First Inhabitants Rights and Equality, also known as Council Fire. So Kevin Cummings is joining us now from our Western Territory, and we are going to check in with him. Thanks for joining us, Kevin. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. No problem. So how is Council Fire going? Uh, it continues to progress. We're now uh, at a point where 18 different state federations uh, have passed resolutions uh, in support of Council Fire, uh, moving through 
to eventually get the uh, AFL-CIO to formally recognize Council Fire as a constituency group. Um, uh, we're a 501c3 uh, nonprofit and a uh, public charity. Uh, we've also been endorsed by the uh, uh, Ontario Labor uh, Provincial Federation up in uh, Canada, uh, as well as LACLA and ILCA and CBTU. Uh, so our mission is uh, finding some good hearts and good ears out there. We continue to grow. So thank you. Well, Council Fire has been a voice for Native American Indian workers. Um, it has done some lobbying. Can you tell us about some of the cases or projects that are going on now that you think are important to highlight and we may not be well, aware of? Uh, yes. Uh, well, there's been uh, a huge uh, uptick in awareness of uh, uh, issues in Indian country, uh, the Violence Against Women's Act a couple of years ago. Uh, which uh, uh, was a huge improvement uh, because of uh, most people understand the uh, issues of the murdered and missing uh, indigenous women. Uh, and Washington, Seattle area, uh, actually is the uh, the center where uh, much of that uh, damage is is happening. Uh, we have uh, uh, just witnessed some issues in uh, voting where uh, reservations were attacked to block. Native Americans from voting and uh, the issues with voters of color, uh, not just Native, uh, um, need to be attacked at every opportunity. Uh, the uh, pipelines uh, that violate uh, the treaties of 150 uh, years ago, uh, there's uh, no shortage of areas of, of concern. Uh, currently, there's uh, uh, some movement underfoot to uh, uh, in honor of uh, Thanksgiving, there's a, a movement uh, to address the tribe that actually had the first Thanksgiving with the pilgrims, the Washpanoag up in uh, uh, Massachusetts. There's a, a movement to try and strip them of some of the land uh, that they've uh, lived on for 10,000 years. So there's no shortage of areas to look, whether it's uh, addressing the poverty, Indian health care, uh, which mirrors uh, health care issues in uh, rural communities, uh, not just native, uh, but it is acute to uh, uh, reservation life. Uh, the, the numbers are horrific and there's uh, uh, many areas that we can go, whether it's suicide rates or dropout rates or the violence against women. Uh, un uh, unemployment is 85% on some of the reservations, uh, which is uh, just despicable, and that's uh, within the shores of, of this nation, the most uh, advanced and wealthy nation on the planet, and the people that were here first are suffering. Uh, Did you say 85%? 85%. That is unbelievable. I mean, that's worse than, wasn't the Great Depression something like 30%? Yes. That's crazy. Yeah, we have uh, suicide rates that in some sectors of uh, native population are 19 times uh, the national average. Uh, and, and those are things that uh, we're working to at least uh, lift awareness to because nobody talks about those things. And that's where the need for council fire arose. Why are these numbers so much worse in Indian country? Well, there's uh, a myriad of reasons. Uh, because of uh, the sovereign nation status, there's been a neglect uh, with infrastructure. Uh, there's been a, a, a huge issue with dropout rates in school and uh, health uh, issues, uh, generations of, uh, of oppression. Uh, there's a, a difficult time, which is changing. Uh, we're seeing a, a huge uptick in uh, the tribes that do have casinos, and by the way, it's only about 20% that actually have uh, casinos, and it's uh, about a third of that where the casinos are profitable. But there's a branching out uh, to get involved in other revenue streams. Uh, through the Small Business Administration, tribes are now getting involved, um, federally recognized tribes, I should say, are getting involved in uh, bidding on service contracts. and. Uh, Davis-Bacon construction contracts and starting to come out of 
uh, the extreme poverty and uh, starting to develop skills. And a lot of that's in partnership with labor unions, uh, with our generations of skill sets and the huge need and the opportunities for work for our members. Um, it's a, a natural win-win, uh, which has been a, a, a good gift that Council Fire can help share and make people aware of. Uh, there, there's some good stories that are, are coming out every day. Kevin, you mentioned that first tribe, um, and I think it was the first Thanksgiving was, was recorded as 1621. That's and that right. first tribe is still trying to fight for its land. Um, you know, we, we are one day from Thanksgiving. So that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about was there are so many differing views out there about Thanksgiving itself and the perceptions around it. I wanted to give you a chance to address those different perceptions. Well, I think uh, uh, one of the, the big things is that it wasn't the pilgrims that put this on. Uh, it was the Washpanoag. Uh, they uh, had reached out to help the newcomers uh, survive the winter. Uh, and they taught them uh, secrets of crop rotation and planting crops next to each other that traded the, the right nutrients so that uh, you'd get the most bounty, uh, which crops to grow, how to survive the heavy winter, how to fish and uh, trap. And uh, the celebration is something the tribes had been doing for millennia. Uh, and they reached out to celebrate the harvest and to thank Mother Earth for the gifts that she brought forward, and they invited their new neighbors. Uh, so the, uh, the conception that this was something that the pilgrims did and invited the Indians is actually 180 degrees from the truth. Uh, the, uh, uh, the newcomers, the pilgrims, would not have survived that first winter without the help of the tribes. Uh, and it was uh, a point of honor to welcome new people and to try and be good uh, neighbors. Uh, there had been interaction between the tribes for uh, since the dawn of time with helping each other as tribes migrated and followed the herds or uh, suffering to get through the winters. There was a, a huge leaning on each other and the gratifying celebration of uh, thanking Mother Earth for providing what they needed to get through is the basis of Thanksgiving. Uh, it has uh, expanded to now be thankful for your relatives and being thankful for, you know, uh, other things that, that come in. But it's uh, it began as a, a appreciation of the Creator and for supplying our needs. Thank you so much for explaining that. We appreciate it, even though it really hit me when you said that, uh, you know, there's a possible land grab and fighting for land, you know, hundreds of years later. Um, just can't believe that. And I hope... Well, it's, uh, there's a lot of that going on. We just uh, uh, witnessed the issues with the pipelines. Uh, they violate several treaties. Uh, some going back 150 years, uh, violate Supreme Court decisions that affirmed the treaties. Um, uh, NAFTA and the TPP both uh, include language uh, that uh, penalizes nations for honoring treaties. Uh, and there's uh, no shortage of areas that uh, we need to awaken to and get involved with. Uh, the treaties were signed between nations to put ends to war and they need to be honored and protected the same as every other treaty and if there's going to be changes to those the uh, the tribes that signed them should be invited to the table to represent their interests as well instead of other groups getting together and then dictating out of the meetings what should happen Kevin we have Heather Keller with Heather Keller, Heather Kelly, with a comment saying, "Thank you, Kevin, for raising our indigenous indigenous members' voices." I can't talk oh, today, you. but Heather can. Thank you, Heather. Uh, we have a lot of members. As I speak, uh, um, quite often I'll ask for people in the audience that uh, have native blood to lift their hands, and uh, it's overwhelming. Uh, this is a voice. Uh, that's missing at the in the chorus of labor. 
Uh, we have groups that address the issues of women, of blacks, of Latinos, LGBTQ, Pacific Islanders, veterans, elders, but there's never been a voice uh, that presented the issues in Indian country and pulled everybody uh, into focus, uh, looking for opportunities and ways to make improvements. So it, the IM has been uh, tremendous in uh, supporting this and, I, and I've got to give special appreciation to our international president, uh, Martinez, my GVP, Gary Allen, retired GVP, Phil Gruber, uh, was phenomenal. Uh, every state in the Midwest Territory has passed a resolution at their state AFL-CIO, and that's through his leadership. Uh, uh, it's been a blessing to to watch good hearts and good ears awaken and, and reach out to, to try and make a, dis, a difference to the people that were here first and have been in, neglected the longest. Now, Kevin, you have worked so hard for the IAM and I understand that you are about to retire. So tell us a little bit about um, looking back on your career, what stands out to you? Well, there's uh, a lot of things that stand out. Uh, um, the uh, WTO rally in, uh, in Seattle, I was a crowd control marshal. Uh, so that, that was uh, a very difficult uh, time. Uh, we had some people that weren't part of labor that got involved and uh, kind of left a black mark on what was a peaceful rally. I'd have to say the uh, one of my most uh, uh, proud uh, periods is the work that we did with the victim advocates, uh, a group of uh, just amazing ladies that support military families through uh, some troubling times, uh, uh, home uh, issues for people that are deployed and then home again and then deployed and back again and the stress they go through that acts out in, in different ways. Uh, but we were able to bring a measure of justice to them from a very unscrupulous employer. Uh, they uh, were able to share a two and a half million dollar wage theft settlement. Uh, we created a classification for them that uh, brought them over a nine dollar an hour raise and brought them some dignity uh, to a job that just uh, we can't say thank you enough. So that I, I think I'm walking away with uh, really having a piece of pride and knowing that I helped there. I wasn't the only one, but uh, that was a five year, five and a half year battle. Uh, and I'm really proud of where we brought them. So what is next for you? Well, um, I'm going to spoil my wife. Uh, this job uh, keeps us away from home. Uh, we miss a lot of uh, birthdays and uh, special days, anniversaries. Uh, uh, so I'm going to spend some time spoiling her. Uh, I've got some guitars and uh, golf clubs that don't know my name anymore. <laughs> so I'm going to spend some time with them and uh, travel a bit. But I'm going to continue with uh, Council Fire. And I in intend to remain involved in the labor movement. This isn't something you retire from. It's something we believe in just like going to church. Uh, we don't stop just because we reach a certain age or get tired and don't want to do it 60 hours a week anymore. It's just another part of stepping forward. Uh, and so I'm just moving into a new phase, but I'm still going to be involved. And I look forward to uh, seeing all my brothers and sisters down the road and seeing you again. Well, we are so glad that you took the time out to speak with us, and we want to congratulate you on your retirement. Uh, you deserve time off after all that hard work for so many years. Thank you. I'm uh, really proud of the IAM. Uh, and if anybody's listening and you have uh, family or friends or even enemies that need some help on their jobs, you can't do better than choosing the IAM. Uh, I, it's the finest labor organization on the planet, and I've been with them for over 30 years and uh, really proud of who I'm associated with and the opportunities that have been gifted to me. Well, thank you. Soon to be retired Kevin Cummings of our Western Territory. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank well, you. we're going to take a look at our calendar of some events that are coming up. And as we get later in the year, they become fewer 
and fewer. But we have registrations due now for the federal employee program that takes place February 3rd to the 8th of 2019. That deadline is December 6th. The Veteran Services Program that takes place March 31st to April 5th. That deadline is coming up January 28th. And for more information, you can go to the website, wimpasinger.iamaw.org. Org. We also have a council meeting coming up November 29th to December 1st. That's the Washington State Council is having its fourth quarter meeting in Union, Washington. So mark your calendars for that. And next spring, we have a conference coming up, a women's conference, April 2nd to the 6th. It's called, or the theme is Women Rising Unite the Fight. That will take place at Bally's in Las Vegas, Nevada. So as I understand it, call letters should be out. So look for your call letters in your mailbox or in your email. Um, this information is also in the bottom of email. So if you get our twice weekly email to your inbox, it, information should be there. And the IAM's 2019 Communications Conference is going to be taking place in June, June 4th to the 6th, um, at Planet Hollywood in Las Vegas. That's where you will learn to activate your voices. All the communicators out there that are interested, um, you can now register for the IAM's Communications Conference and learn all about voice activation. Uh, so the communications department is really looking forward to that. Uh, we're trying to come up with some great workshops and great speakers. Um, so we hope that all of you are marking your calendars for all these wonderful events. So that is all that we've got for Activate Live this week. We'd like to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving from the Machinist Union. Hopefully you have time off. Um, thank you for all your hard work you do in your shops and your union halls. We are the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers.